Welcome back to the Girls Camp Podcast. It is your host, Haley Rawl. And let me just say, you think you would know a thing or two about Mormonism if you, like me, grew up in the faith, spent 25 years of your life as a Mormon, served a Mormon mission, the whole thing. And doing this deep dive into the deep doctrines of the Mormon church had me so shocked how little not only I knew, but how little I thought about some of these things that I had heard, right? I think if you grow up Mormon, you kind of hear of these deep doctrines. You know they're being spoken about here or there. Maybe you dive down the rabbit hole of one or two of them. But I don't know, reading through all of these deep doctrine things and then actually kind of getting to the bottom of it, of where they originated from, if the church stands by those things or not, was so wild. And I kept thinking, how did I not wonder about some of these things a little bit more when I was a Mormon? But we will talk about that in course because there's much to discuss when it comes to not only the deep doctrines themselves, because there are some really wacky ones, but also just kind of what they say about Mormon culture, about being Mormon, the whole shebang. So I'm super excited to get into that. Before we do... Let's do a campfire chat catch up. We are leaving to LA in February and I keep saying we're moving there and I was realizing the other day, we're not really moving there. We're just going for an extended stay. It feels different than a vacation because we're subletting someone's house and Bentley and I are both working a lot. We're kind of going there to feel out what it would be like to live there, which is why I keep saying we're moving there. But really, we're just going for a month, and I'm so excited, but I'm also pretty nervous. I'm very excited about a change of scenery, a change of pace, very, very, very excited about a change of weather, and I think the only thing making me nervous is the twins. My twin girls are almost two. They'll be two at the end of March, and They just have a lot of stuff. They're used to sleeping in their cribs and being in this house. And I'm kind of worried about throwing them out of a routine more than anything. But I think it will be well worth it. And I think it's going to be good for us as a family. I also am looking forward to just doing something different. I don't know. It's pretty far outside of my personality to be doing something like this because I'm such a routines person and even going on trips sometimes just feels like stressful and overwhelming. So I feel like I'm proud of myself for doing something out of my comfort zone. Very grateful that Bentley and I both have the flexibility to do this. And I feel like opportunity awaits in LA. We'll see if what they say is true about Los Angeles, but it does seem like There's a lot of opportunity there, and I'm excited to do some networking. I have some really exciting interviews already lined up, some guests that are coming back on the show that I think everyone's going to be really excited about, and I can't wait. So next week, you'll be hearing from me with an interview that I'm doing, also very exciting, here in Utah, and then I will be coming at you live from sunny, hopefully, Los Angeles. Let's dive into the deep doctrine stuff. And before I start reading through some of these submissions that you all wrote in about random deep doctrines that you know or have heard of, I was thinking about this analogy that came to me. It was actually over the summer. I was on a walk with my girls. I think I was listening to a podcast about Christianity, actually. And I kind of had this epiphany by way of an analogy, an analogy, That's kind of a tongue twister. But I was thinking about Mormonism and the world of Mormonism and comparing it to Harry Potter. Bear with me. But what I was thinking about is how there was a long phase of my Mormonism where if we're thinking about the world of Mormonism and the world of Harry Potter, you know when you're reading Harry Potter or a fantasy book and you notice a loophole in the story And it's kind of annoying because you're like, wait, if that spell could conjure up food, then why is anybody starving? Where is the food actually coming from? Or if people in Harry Potter can essentially teleport this way, then why can't these people teleport that way? Like you're just discovering kind of loopholes in the world that has been built. And I feel like my progressive Mormonism phase, I was doing that within the world of Mormonism, where I was 
spending so much time and energy trying to make it work and noticing loopholes, things that didn't sit right or didn't fully pan out or make sense in the doctrines. And then there was these other doctrines that would kind of try and make up for those doctrines. And anyway, I spent a lot of time doing that. But then when you think about this Harry Potter world, of course, you eventually just take a step back and say, well, actually, this whole thing is made up, right? (laughs) So of course, we could discuss loopholes within the world. But taking the full step back, it's a fantasy world that is not real. And I think that was one of the shifts for me that happened in my deconstruction journey where I was spending so much time trying to make the world of Mormonism work. And finally, I was able to take a step back and say, wait, I don't think any of this world is real. And that's why some of these things, a lot of these things are not quite adding up because it's not real. Like, I just don't believe in it at all anymore. And that might sound kind of harsh for people who are, you know, believing Mormons. I'm not comparing Mormonism directly with Harry Potter wizards magic, that sort of thing. I'm really not. But it was kind of a helpful way for me to think through like the steps and the levels of my deconstruction and realizing that for me, progressive Mormonism was so frustrating because I was trying so, so hard to make it work. And then when I just had this realization that I didn't believe in any of it, it was such a relief to just take that full step back and be like, oh, I don't have to do the mental gymnastics to try and piece all of this together and consistently and continually be trying to like get this world to work because the world didn't work for me. And I didn't believe it fundamentally. I was thinking about that as I was reading through these deep doctrines, because these deep doctrines to me are kind of like the type of thing where if you're super into Harry Potter or you're super into Lord of the Rings or Star Wars, it feels almost like not necessarily fan fiction, but it feels like the things that hardcore Lord of the Rings fans are discussing on Reddit about Gandalf or something like just really deep kind of random pieces of what makes the world, what makes these characters in this world. And I find it all really fascinating, especially now on this side of things where I don't believe Mormonism is true. It's actually really fun and really interesting to dig into these particularly strange, esoteric, doctrinal parts of the Mormon world. All right, let's dive into the doctrines, shall we? And I'm going to start off with a banger. This is one I had never heard of, and I'm shocked I had never heard of it. So many of you wrote it in, and many of you just wrote in TK Smoothie. So I was scrolling through the submissions and just seeing TK Smoothie, TK Smoothie, and I'm like, TK Smoothie, what on earth is a TK Smoothie? I had never heard of it before. I had no context. So I Google TK Smoothie, and boy, oh boy, is this an interesting deep doctrine. Okay, so this originated from something that Joseph Fielding Smith, who was the 10th prophet of the Mormon church, said. And he said, essentially, that if you do not go to the celestial kingdom, the highest degree of heaven after you die, and you go to either the telestial or the terrestrial kingdom, terrestrial? Why does that word sound so weird? Anyway, if you go to either of the lower two kingdoms, you will not have the ability to procreate, aka have sex, and the way that Joseph Fielding Smith put it, he said there will be neither man nor woman. That was his exact wording. So he was saying in the lower kingdoms, you won't have gender. There won't be men or women because you won't need to procreate. Therefore, you won't have the ability to. Therefore, you will be not gendered. So if you have not put the pieces of this puzzle together yet, TK, Telestial or Terrestrial Kingdom, And smoothie is referencing what a being would look like without genitals. (laughs) So basically like smoothie as in what a Barbie or a Ken doll look like in the genital area because it's smooth because there's nothing there. TK smoothie. Something feels oddly poetic about learning about this particular doctrine 
in the wake of the Barbie movie and in the era of the Barbie movie because it's so Ken doll coded. And I haven't completely unpacked that yet, but I thought it was worth mentioning. This one really blew my mind. It blew my mind. I hadn't heard of it. It blew my mind also because I think we could get really into what this all says about the idea of gender and the construct of gender in the Mormon church, because I think it kind of flies in the face in many ways of the church saying gender is eternal. I mean, it does completely fly in the face of the church saying gender is eternal and just really attaching gender to biology, you know, how someone is born, their genitals, that defines their gender. There's so much we could get into there that I'm not going to go all the way down that rabbit hole, but I think it's interesting to think about because essentially what Joseph Fielding Smith was saying is if you don't make it to the celestial kingdom, then you don't have a gender anymore. So is gender eternal or is it a construct? And what makes someone's gender? Is it their genitals or something else. Super interesting to think about. TK Smoothie, if you, like me, grew up Mormon, abandoned the faith, then perhaps we will all be TK Smoothies together in the afterlife. And I'm hoping it'll be a little bit like a Barbie dream house sort of situation. The next write-in reads, Colob. What the fuck is Colob? What the fuck indeed? I have heard Colob referenced Many, many a time growing up Mormon, there's a song, If You Could Hide to Kolob in the Twinkling of an Eye, which I still sometimes quote just because I think it's so kind of dramatic and amazing. If you could hide to Kolob in the Twinkling of an Eye, I don't know. It's always stuck with me. And for some reason, I never really thought to wonder all that much about what Kolob is. I think I thought it was sort of like a symbolic reference to heaven or something like that. That was my understanding until late last night when I started researching what actually is Kolob. So Kolob is referred to in the Pearl of Great Price, which is kind of a conglomerate of translations and revelations from Joseph Smith. It's kind of like a companion to the Doctrine and Covenants in the Mormon scriptural canon. And Kolob is spoken about apparently by Abraham, which was then translated by Joseph Smith, as the place, a star or a planet where God either lives or that is close to where God actually lives. So Kolob is God's residence, his or hers or their resident planet, Kolob. Okay, there we have it. The address of God is Kolob, this planet or star. And some people have speculated that Kolob is actually a specific star, the star Sirius. I want any of my astrology girlies to tap in, chime in about the significance of Sirius as a star. I have no idea. Maybe there's something interesting there the overlap of astrology and this weird Kolob thing. Some people have said it's serious, and there are some people who will say Kolob is not actually a place. A lot of people in Mormonism, it seems, have interpreted this passage of scripture to be symbolic of Jesus Christ. So they're essentially saying, oh no, Kolob is a symbol for Christ who lives with God, is close to God, whatever. But If you go to the text itself, it's speaking pretty straightforwardly about an actual physical planet or star. When I was at Book of Mormon, the musical in New York, I went by myself. I was sitting on the fifth row just alone amongst a crowd of people. And during intermission, there was this man behind me and he was speaking to his adult daughter and they were talking about the play because there's a line in the play in this song called I Believe. And it says, I believe that God lives on a planet called Kolob, I think is the line, something like that. And they were discussing that line. And he was saying, yeah, you know, Mormons believe that they all will get their own planet someday. That's part of the doctrine is that once they die, they'll go get their own planet. And I was partially impressed that they knew that funny little doctrinal element of Mormonism. And I was tempted to turn around and be like, oh my gosh, I'm a Mormon. Like I was a Mormon and and talk about it with them, but I didn't. 
But yeah, the collab thing reminds me of the we will all have our own worlds one day, become gods of our own worlds, which I think fairly recently the church actually clarified and said that that is not official doctrine, that if you're Mormon, you will get your own planet. So kind of a bummer because that would be a perk for sure. If Mormonism turns out to be true and you stuck with it the whole way, getting your own planet would be pretty cool. A couple more interesting facts about Kolob. Brigham Young actually said that people live on Kolob, not just God. He said there are inhabitants of distant planets, including Kolob. People live there. Aliens, I don't know. People like us, I don't know. That's something Brigham Young said. Add it to the list of very interesting things said by Brigham Young. Another interesting fact is that a man who worked on Battlestar Galactica, the TV show, let me see what his name is, Glenn A. Larson is Mormon. And in the show, there is a planet called Kobol, K-O-B-O-L. So just switching the L and the B. And there's apparently some other LDS references in Battlestar Galactica. So there you have it. Some Mormonism sneaking in to science fiction again. And what does that say about Mormonism? Okay, next submission. I had a Mormon seminary teacher tell me that evolution is a lie, that dinosaurs never existed, and that there are only dinosaur fossils on the earth so that, quote, we can have fossil fuels. Even my true believing Mormon ninth grade brain thought that was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard. And I didn't have the heart to tell him that you can't just make petroleum out of ground up dinosaur footprints. Also, I kind of doubt God is super into big oil, IDK. You guys, it actually never crossed my brain until very recently, pretty far out of the church, that evolution does not line up with Christianity or with Mormon doctrine. I had never really thought about it. I believed in evolution. That's what I was taught in school. But I also, of course, believed the Bible, the story of Adam and Eve being the first beings on the planet, God placing them there. I don't know what it was in my brain. I just never realized that those two things don't actually make sense together, (laughs) that those two narratives are very much in conflict with each other. And I think that says a lot about the critical thinking centers in my brain as a Mormon, just taking wholesale this Adam and Eve thing and not even realizing that those two things couldn't exist together. I don't know. It was kind of a trip when I think we had our friends over, Judd and Carly, and someone brought up the evolution thing. And I realized, oh my God, I never even thought about that. I had never even thought about it. Kind of crazy. But yes, there is a reckoning that must be made between the timeline laid out in the Bible that Joseph Smith also taught and confirmed versus evolution and dinosaurs and that sort of thing. It was difficult to find much on the internet official church doctrine about this reconciliation between evolution and the beginning of the planet being the Adam and Eve thing. The only thing I did find is a Bruce R. McConkie talk. And this person who wrote in about the dinosaurs referenced this. So thank you. This talk was given in 1980 and it's called the seven deadly heresies. And one of the heresies, which Bruce R. McConkie talks about is evolution. So It's really interesting to read this talk because there's this whole spiel that Bruce R. McConkie goes on, and he doesn't ever say directly evolution is a lie, but he very much implies it and kind of like frames it in this really interesting way where he's like, you know, I'm not saying evolution's a lie, but if you believe the Bible, then evolution's a lie. It's weird how he goes about it. One of the quotes from that talk, Bruce R. McConkie says, heresy two, am I saying that right? Heresy, I think so. Heresy two concerns itself with the relationship between organic evolution and revealed religion and asks the question whether they can be harmonized. And then again, he essentially goes on to say they can't really, which is pretty wild. It's basically saying evolution isn't real, There's so much science, obviously, that supports evolution. And when I went searching again on like official church doctrine and stuff, I couldn't find anything super specific around this besides this talk, which is from a long time ago, 1980. But 
yeah, that one also blew my mind that maybe I as a Mormon actually didn't believe in evolution. I mean, I personally did, but that Mormonism and Christianity even generally it's hard to reconcile the evolution thing unless you believe in some of the biblical accounts of the beginning of the earth as more symbolic. You would have to take it a lot less literally, I think, which I know many people do, but many people also take it very literally. Someone else wrote in on the same topic and they said, I was taught in Sunday school as a teenager that dinosaurs were from other worlds and that the fossils came from other worlds when Jesus put together the pieces of quote, unorganized matter to create this planet. The teacher essentially explained away the millions of years of carbon dated evidence for evolution by saying that Jesus used leftovers to make the earth. Many other people wrote in the same thing and said that as Mormons, they were taught that the reason that there are dinosaur fossils on earth is because when Jesus created the earth, he was pulling pieces of matter from the universe that those pieces of matter happen to have dinosaur fossils in them from other ancient worlds. I don't know how the dinosaurs ended up there or who started those worlds. Seems like there are more loopholes introduced by that theory than it is an easy explanation, but there you have it. I had never heard that one myself. Like I said, I had never really thought about it. I don't remember being taught that Dinosaur bones were part of the organic matter that was pulled by Jesus to make the earth, but apparently a lot of you were. Next, deep doctrine. Someone said, Growing up, I remember being taught that one day, around the time of the second coming, all of the faithful Latter-day Saints would move back to Missouri. I heard this one a lot growing up, but I remember hearing it, you know, growing up and then into young adulthood, and I never thought that deeply about it, but it was definitely something that I remember Missouri was super significant. I remember learning that Jesus would come to Missouri during the second coming. So we would all just like travel there because we would want to be where Jesus was during the second coming. And then Jesus would be there during the millennium. And this one does check out doctrinally from the official church doctrine. Not that people need to move to Missouri to like prepare for the second coming or the end of days, which I know some maybe more extreme Mormons do think that they need to be in Missouri. I know the church has bought a lot of land in Missouri to prepare for the second coming. But what does check out doctrinally is that Jesus will come back to the Americas, to Jackson, Missouri, which will be called Zion, the new Jerusalem, and Jesus will reign from Jackson, Missouri during the millennium. So that is official church doctrine. I do find it very interesting that it is Jackson, Missouri. It obviously has historical significance from the beginning days of the church, but interesting that they kind of fixated on Jackson, Missouri as the place. I've never been to Missouri, not super interested in going to Missouri, honestly. I know there are church tours and Missouri is often part of the church tours because it does have a lot of historical significance to Mormons. If anyone's listening from Missouri, no hate to your state. I don't know much about it. I'm sure it's great in a lot of ways. But if the second coming does happen while I'm still alive, we'll probably jet on over to Missouri and see what's going on and visit Zion, the new Jerusalem in the millennium. We'll see. Next write in says that missionaries and members in general could not go in any form of water on Sundays because Satan has free reign over the waters. I randomly remembered learning this growing up during the summer and I made a TikTok about it. That was oddly controversial. I had a lot of people in my comments, Mormons telling me this isn't true. This is completely made up. I've never heard this, so it must not be true. And then of course, a lot of people also saying, oh yeah, I was never allowed to swim on Sundays growing up. Of course, missionaries are not allowed to get into the water. It already starts to beg some questions such as if Satan was the ruler of the waters, then why would Satan distinguish between someone swimming on a Sunday versus any other day of the week? I guess we can take our chances with Satan, but not on a Sunday, and missionaries can't take their chances. It never really made all that much sense. Also, what about showering? 
This is not completely supported by church doctrine. It is not supported by church doctrine that Satan is the master over the waters, but there's a really interesting origin story for where this deep doctrine came from and why people believe it. But I would classify this one more as folklore, something that people like something that's an unofficial thing that a lot of people still believe, but again, isn't officially backed up. So where it comes from is Doctrine and Covenants, section 61. There's the story about Joseph Smith and a bunch of other Mormon men, and they are traveling down the Missouri River. And apparently the journey on the river is quite treacherous, and they're like encountering all sorts of problems, etc. And Elder William W. Phelps whoever he may be, that he saw the destroyer riding in power upon the face of the waters. So we're assuming the destroyer means Satan. He saw Satan on the waters. And when they got back from their trip down the river, they told everybody, don't travel by river. You should travel by land. But also in that section, they say that you should travel by land, not necessarily because the water is dangerous, though they did mention that, but mainly because If you're taking the water, you are not going through towns and cities and spreading the gospel along the way. So that was really the crux of the issue was they were saying, don't take the river. You got to take the land route so that you can be teaching and preaching as you travel. That was really interesting to learn because I remember as a missionary genuinely feeling guilty about the modes of transportation we would take. And I remember talking to missionaries who had bikes and missionaries who had cars. I didn't have that. So I was always on public transportation, like the metro in Germany or walking. And missionaries that had bikes or cars would sometimes say they felt guilty because when they were traveling to and from, they weren't preaching to people where if you're walking or if you're on the train, you can be like talking to people around you and you can stop people on the street and try and teach them the gospel. And so for me as a walking missionary, my whole mission, anywhere I went at all times, I was always like, even if we were in a hurry, I was trying to see who was walking by and make sure I was open to the spirit to tell me like, oh, you need to talk to that person, which made me an anxious mess at all times because it was very stressful. But yeah, that whole concept of not taking the river, I think definitely persists in modern culture as well for missionaries specifically. And from that whole kind of random story came this belief that I think is quite persistent in LDS communities, even to this day, that Satan controls the water. But good news, Satan, according to LDS theology, does not control the waters. After all, I think you probably just would be advised not to swim on Sunday, more so to keep the Sabbath day holy, and missionaries are not allowed to swim, probably because missionaries are not allowed to do a lot of things. Okay, this next one is a doozy. The second anointing. This person who wrote this submission in said the second anointing that literally makes it to where they can do anything but be pardoned into the highest degree of celestial glory. Let's talk about the second anointing. I feel like this one tends to be kind of a shelf breaker for people when they learn about this, which is interesting to me because I don't find myself more bothered about this than any other doctrine that I'm bothered by in the church, but I can also understand because of what this person said, right? The second anointing is shrouded in a lot of secrecy, even more secrecy than the other temple covenants that are also shrouded in quite a bit of secrecy. But the second anointing is essentially when people have made their way up high enough in the church that they get called in with their spouse to do the second anointing, which is a special temple ritual where they come in and part of the ritual is, I think they wash each other's feet, like the husband and the wife wash each other's feet. And there's some language in the second anointing that makes it sound very much like these people are being told, you are now, as of this ritual, this anointing, you are now going to make it to the celestial kingdom for sure no matter what. And so that's why it's troublesome for people is, okay, what if you make it to the second anointing and then you go murder a bunch of people or what have you, but you've been told no matter what you do, this anointing makes it so that you will go to the celestial kingdom no matter what. 
And yeah, it's weird. It's weird that they're doing this very secretly. I find it more problematic personally that it's kind of establishing this weird secret hierarchy within the Mormon church where there's always kind of whispers on the wind of who's made it to the second anointing. And it's like something that maybe people aspire to because to me, more than anything, it seems like kind of a status symbol and you're being pulled into this upper echelon of increased secrecy and increased elitism of righteousness within the Mormon church, which is freaky to me. The language specifically that is used in the second anointing, here's a few phrases, being sealed up unto eternal life, having your calling and election made sure, and receiving the more sure word of prophecy. So does this actually mean according to church doctrine, that these people will make it to the celestial kingdom no matter what. Joseph Smith, apparently, as well as other church leaders, have taught that these blessings even still are conditional upon faithfulness. So even if you get to the second anointing, if you're no longer faithful, they don't count anymore. However, Orson Pratt, who was an apostle, he wasn't a prophet, an apostle, I think, taught that being sealed unto eternal life via the second anointing would guarantee exaltation no matter what. And you may already be noticing a pattern here, which is that these doctrines are so interesting because the actual official stance on them by the church is often very vague. There is nowhere you can go that just says exactly what it is, exactly what, quote, the church believes. And there's a lot of different opinions from prophets and apostles. And that's complicated because you are told that prophets and apostles are speaking for God. They're the mouthpieces of God guiding the church on earth. But what happens when those people disagree, when they share different opinions, or when they share a completely different take on a doctrine? What do we make of that? That is one of the loopholes of the world of Mormonism that bothered me quite a bit as I was deconstructing. And now that I've stepped away, and as I said, I don't think any of it is true or real, it's really interesting to think about what that says about the church and church culture and how people within the church make sense of what oftentimes pops up as prophets saying things that don't always align with other prophets and apostles, et cetera, et cetera. And again, just with these deep doctrines that the church never just says officially what's true, I don't know. It lends itself to a lot of interesting speculation. This is a fun one. Bigfoot is a descendant of Cain. This was another one I had heard whispered upon the wind as a Mormon person. Never thought that much about it. It seemed so outlandish that it didn't even seem bothersome. It just seemed kind of crazy. So let's talk about where this comes from and if it actually checks out. Spencer W. Kimball, in his book, The Miracle of Forgiveness, tells an account of an apostle named David Patton, who met a very large, hairy man who identified himself as Cain. Kimball doesn't identify Cain specifically as Bigfoot, but that idea has become part of Mormon folklore because President Kimball did say there was this big, hairy man who said they were Cain. And If you don't know who I'm talking about with Cain, we're talking about the Cain of the Bible, Cain and Abel, the older brother who murdered his younger brother Abel and then was cast out by the Lord, that Cain. And apparently some people believe that Cain still walks the earth to this very day as kind of a cursed being a la Bigfoot. Beyond just the Spencer W. Kimball account, there are two other documented cases of church members encountering a, quote, Cain-like figure in the early days of the church in Nauvoo. So those are also some documented cases of apparently meeting Cain from the Bible and this person Cain being big and hairy, like Bigfoot. I don't think you could say that the church officially teaches that Cain is still around as Bigfoot or some sort of Sasquatch, but there's enough there to fuel that folklore of Bigfoot being Kane, and I think it's funny and interesting. This Kane bigfoot thing reminds me a lot of the three Nephite thing. I love the three Nephite folklore. Well, I guess it's not even really folklore because in the Book of Mormon, there are three 
Nephites who are essentially granted immortality. And so a lot of Mormons believe that these three Nephite people are kind of like guardian angels. I feel like many Mormons have stories where they're driving in the middle of the night and their car breaks down and out of nowhere, some big man appears and quietly helps them fix their car. And then they kind of like disappear into the night, like those kind of stories. I actually have some family members who were apparently hiking one day in Havasupai in Arizona, and it was a super hot day. They had underestimated how much water they needed to bring, and they were hiking, and they were tired, and they were dehydrated, and then these three men came up and had water and offered them water, and so they said, ooh, maybe it was the three Nephites, and I don't know how literally people believe in the three Nephites, but I do feel like that was tossed around a lot growing up. I heard people talking about that. That. And there's a fantastic joke in The Singles Ward, which is a Mormon movie, not made by the Mormon church, but made by Mormons. And it's a really funny movie. I want to do a full breakdown, deep dive on those type of Mormon movies. Singles Ward, The RM, Sons of Provo. Lucy and I have been talking, Lucy Hutchins, who came on the podcast fairly recently, and we are going to do a Sons of Provo deep dive soon. So watch it if you haven't. I think it's actually absolutely hilarious and has stood the test of time and has stood the test of a faith transition. I still find it so funny, even funnier now outside of Mormonism. I digress. In the singles ward, there is a joke that is repeated throughout the movie where someone is telling a story and the punchline is always, it was because of the three big men standing behind them. So there's a story of two sister missionaries and they knock on someone's door and the person at the door is like some scary mobster or something. But the mobster like quietly shuts the door and doesn't harm them. And later that person is asked, well, why didn't you harm them or kidnap them? And then they say, because of the three big men standing behind them. So the three Nephites as these kind of guardian angel figures. And I still joke about the three Nephites fairly often, I would say, because I think it's really funny. Whenever you get a helping hand or someone kind of randomly out of the blue pops up to help, who knows? Might just be a three knee fight. I heard once, if you're in spirit heaven, not prison, LMAO, you can travel to any place at any time period. And that actually sounds fucking sick. I want to be a time traveling ghost. Same. I never heard this one. They are referring to after you die, Kylie Kadish and I tried to break this down. You die, you go to spirit, either prison or paradise. And I actually learned since recording with Kylie that that is the same place. It is the same location, spirit, prison and paradise. But the reason it would be prison as opposed to paradise is how you feel inside. (laughs) I don't know why that's so funny to me, but it's essentially like, Everyone will go there, but you might be there tortured that you like left the church in your mortal existence, or you might be there just happy as a clam in paradise because you did all the right things. And apparently, according to this person, if you are in spirit paradise, you would be allowed to travel throughout time. And yeah, I agree. It would be pretty cool to be a time traveling ghost in spirit paradise. But unfortunately, I believe I've given up that right. Next one. I remember hearing in church as a kid that God created a bunch of earths, but we were the only earth with people evil enough to kill Christ, but that the atonement of Christ somehow worked for those other worlds too. I heard this growing up as well, and it was taught to me in this way of, whoa, our earth is really, really evil because no other earth out of all the earths created by God were evil enough to kill Christ. And that's why God sent Christ to this earth because, you know, the people killed him, crucified him. And what an interesting thing to think. Bruce R. McConkie pops up yet again. And, you know, Bruce R. McConkie tends to pop up when you are talking about weird, deep doctrines or like problematic things. I feel like when it comes to deeply problematic things spoken from the pulpit, Bruce R. McConkie's name is always going to be right up there in the running for saying some pretty wild shit. And Bruce R. McConkie on this subject said, 
Now our Lord's jurisdiction and power extend far beyond the limits of this one small earth on which we dwell. He is under the Father, the creator of worlds without number, and the atonement of Christ, being literally and truly infinite, applies to an infinite number of earths. That seems pretty clear to me that Bruce R. McConkie is saying that this is true. Not necessarily that Jesus was sent here to be you know, killed, but that the atonement of Jesus Christ happened on this planet by us as people and that that atonement applies to all of the people in other worlds. And this is interesting to think about because you think of if you were an alien on another planet and you were learning the gospel of Jesus Christ, of Mormonism, and they said there was this guy named Jesus, he was sent to another planet, the aliens of that planet killed Jesus. And because those people killed Jesus, he atoned for your sins and you can be saved. So think how even further removed that would be if this were actually the case. Pretty interesting. Next one. I was taught that Heavenly Father has multiple wives and that's why Heavenly Mother isn't talked about. Woof. I had never heard this. And Heavenly Mother, I think we could kind of classify as a deep doctrine in and of itself because of how obscure and ambiguous the things we know about Heavenly Mother are or the things that the Mormon Church teaches about Heavenly Mother are. And I know the Heavenly Mother thing is a really big deal for a lot of us. And for a lot of us is kind of a shelf breaker or the impetus for deconstructing Mormonism because you start to realize, hmm, why am I only worshiping a male deity? Wouldn't this male deity have a partner based on what we're taught about the purpose of being beings on this earth and getting married, et cetera, et cetera? And if that partner were a female deity, then why don't we get to learn about her? Why don't we get to emulate her? Why don't we get to pray to her? And it becomes quite glaringly obvious that a female deity, ultimate God figure is missing in Mormonism. That all I had gone through myself, but I never heard about this polygamist edge to it. That may be the reason we don't learn about Heavenly Mother is because there are more than one. The apostle Orson Pratt taught, and I quote, we have now clearly shown that God the Father had a plurality of wives and that after her death, Mary, the mother of Jesus, may have become another eternal polygamous wife of God. He also stated that Christ had multiple wives, Mary of Bethany, Martha, and Mary Magdalene as further evidence in defense of polygamy. It was not only taught by Orson Pratt that Heavenly Father had multiple wives, John Taylor also taught it, But church leaders since then have usually referred to a mother in heaven as a single person. So this is something that, I mean, it was taught quite explicitly back in the earlier days of the church and is now not really spoken about, but it also hasn't been specifically denounced. And that might just be because Heavenly Mother isn't really spoken about, as I mentioned before. The thing I had always heard about Heavenly Mother is that Heavenly Mother wasn't spoken about because God was trying to protect her because she was so sacred that he didn't want to like allow people to ever know about Heavenly Mother, which is kind of the epitome of benevolent sexism. Oh, you can't know about my wife and she has no power or sway just because she's so special. I'm, I'm protecting her. That's why. And that's what I believed for a long time. That has actually been officially said that that's not the case, why we don't speak, why Mormons don't speak about Heavenly Mother. But yeah, this polygamist wife thing is really interesting. And saying that Christ had multiple wives is also really interesting. And saying that Mary, mother of Jesus, may have become another eternal polygamist wife of God. Hmm. I didn't do a deep dive on this, but I know a lot of people were taught kind of a deep doctrine that Mary, mother of Jesus, and God actually had physical intercourse in order to impregnate Mary with Jesus. And I can't speak to that entirely because I didn't do any research on it, but I know some people were taught that. I remember actually on my mission, an elder and I were talking on a train from somewhere in Germany to another place in Germany, 
And he was talking about kind of doing a deep dive on that and about how it was his theory that God indeed did have sex with Mary in order to get Jesus, son of God. Anyway, kind of crazy. I know most Mormons would probably say they don't believe in that literally, but I don't know. I didn't do any research on that one. So if you want to go down that rabbit hole, enjoy. Okay, this is the last one. And this one I find quite personal because this was my deep doctrine dive on my mission that I got really kind of obsessed with and really, really into. And I remember feeling, I don't know if unsettled is the right word, but Let me just read this and then I'll tell you more about my journey. Someone said, I've always been fascinated by the Mormon doctrine of intelligences and that God handpicked all of us here on earth because of our intelligences and that all other creations have intelligence, trees, rocks, animals, etc. A strange belief, but also kind of beautiful. I agree. Strange, but also kind of beautiful. I cannot remember how I stumbled across this idea on my mission, but it is in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. So there's like a manual teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. Maybe I was just studying that as a missionary. I don't know. Seems wild that I was just casually perusing that, but I can see my missionary self doing so. And this is the quote about the intelligences. The first principles of man are self-existent with God. God himself, finding he was in the midst of spirits and glory, because he was more intelligent, saw proper to institute laws whereby the rest could have a privilege to advance like himself. The relationship we have with God places us in the situation to advance in knowledge. He has power to institute laws to instruct the weaker intelligences that they may be exalted with himself so that they might have one glory upon another and that all knowledge, power, glory, and intelligence, which is requisite in order to save them, in the world of spirits. To break it down, essentially what that's saying, as I understand it, is that the origin story of God, which is a huge question, right? Okay, if God created all of this, then who created God? The origin story of God is, I kind of imagine it like a sea of like floating souls, like twinkling, glowing souls. God being among that, somehow, realizing, oh, I think I've progressed a little bit beyond the rest of this sea of intelligences in which I find myself. And I'm going to kind of organize things so that the rest of these intelligences can have the opportunity to also progress to where I'm at. Super interesting. It still begs the question, well, where did all the intelligences come from in the first place? But I think it's really interesting because it's saying that God didn't necessarily create the things that beings are made of, that matter, that soul matter always existed. God was just the one who, for whatever reason, was a bit more advanced and could kind of like create structure around that. And as the person who wrote and said, I do find it kind of beautiful. I think I find it beautiful now and I found it unsettling then because I think it kind of speaks to something that I believe now, which is that there is something about us human beings that is infinite, that we are energy, that we are so deeply tied and connected with the universe and the earth and the planets. And there's kind of like a beautiful continuation thing as opposed to feeling like God just poofed into being and created everything. Like feeling like, no, there was something at the beginning of all of this where everything was already there, including the things that make us who we are. But when I was a missionary learning about that, I found it unsettling because I feel like it contradicts a lot of how we are taught to view God as Mormons or how we were taught to view God as Mormons because as Mormons, you know, God is the all-powerful, omnipotent being. And so it feels a little bit blasphemous to think that we all came from the same place. But then again, God was like smarter, I guess, in the beginning anyway. I don't know. But I remember reading that as a missionary, talking about it with the other missionaries and just being in this kind of weird, yeah, rabbit hole for a few weeks on my mission where every personal study, I was like reading up on this and thinking a lot about it. And it's just a very interesting, interesting theory. Not one that I find problematic really, but just an interesting one. And I couldn't find that much else about it in official church literature. 
If you want to go further down that rabbit hole, this is where I was led to next. There is something called the King Follett Discourse that Joseph Smith gave. It was like a talk or something. And he talks about God and the origin story of God. And maybe that quote I actually read about intelligences comes from that discourse. I'm not sure. It could just be like quoted in the teachings of Joseph Smith from this discourse, probably. But anyway, he talks about how God was essentially like us, like among us. And yeah, the origin story of God, what happens after we die. I find myself very, very fascinated. And I think it adds this element of richness to the Mormon world and the Mormon universe. And it's so interesting because when I was a Mormon, I remember feeling, as I mentioned, that unsettled feeling. I think a large part of that unsettled feeling came from this idea that I shouldn't be deep diving into these topics, which is so odd because it was only from the words of Joseph Smith, the founding prophet of the church himself, that I was learning these things. But even still, I kind of felt like there was something forbidden about it. And I think that comes from this idea that the core doctrines of the gospel, repentance, baptism, following Christ and being like Christ. I remember always hearing and learning we could spend our whole lives just learning those basic fundamental principles. We don't need to concern ourselves with these kind of bigger, more cosmological, theological questions. And it was kind of discouraged to get down any of those rabbit holes, not even in, quote, anti-Mormon literature. But I do think there was maybe more implicit than explicit, but I do think there was a little bit of a discouragement from really digging into that stuff. And even as a missionary, I remember feeling guilty, like, oh, I should just be reading Preach My Gospel and like memorizing scripture mastery. I shouldn't be learning about intelligences and the origin story of God. And I find it really interesting that the church is maybe making an effort to keep people in the more straightforward gospel of Christ area, as opposed to these more esoteric, in my opinion, more interesting doctrines, and they don't have a lot of official things on some of these questions. I feel like I barely scratched the surface of the deep doctrines that are out there. There are many more that we will discuss in due time, but this was a fun little intro to all of the deep doctrines that Mormonism provides and where they all come from. So thank you for joining me. Thank you for writing in the deep doctrines that you learned about or heard about. And if you're never Mormon and listening, thanks for tuning in to the wild world of Mormon doctrine. Maybe if you grew up Mormon, you learned a thing or two because I definitely did. And I'll see you on the other side as the TK smoothies that we are all destined to be after this life. Talk to you next week. Bye. Cheese.